Hello and welcome on the barricades. We are today in Bulgaria, in the city of Vanna, our special guest hometown. Ozin Trekov, he is his friend of the show. He's been on our programs quite a few times. Thank you so much for taking the time to Thank join you us today. Me. All right, so uh, just to remind our viewers, you are a sociologist and you've earned a PhD in sociology and uh, your doctoral dissertation is linked to the questions of historical memory collective historical memory and historical narratives and this is precisely what we are going to talk about today because you are about to publish an article I've seen snippets of that article and it seems very interesting and that's actually the reason why I thought I would like to discuss the merits of that text with you today because we're talking about a very dangerous process despite despite the fact that it's not really anything exclusive for Bulgaria it's not even exclusive for Eastern Europe by the way although here the, the kind of historical revision has probably been more intense than in other parts of the world, provided the Soviet past or the Eastern Bloc's past. Yet, today, we see things which are profoundly dangerous, and many of them, you've made that point, by the way, before in our programs, resemble what's been going on recently prior to the war in Ukraine. Tell us about it. Tell us what prompted you to write this text and what are the main points with regards to Bulgaria. Okay, as I say in the text, the main reason for writing it is to serve as a warning of the processes that are happening in Bulgaria, which I think are very similar to what was happening in Ukraine, especially attempts for recreation of new collective memory or production of a new collective memory, which serves as a counter memory in narratives to the established collective memory in relation to the years. Prior to World War, in World War II, and the heroization of certain figures, or if not heroization, at least their positioning as uh, some kind of martyrs and victims of uh, communism, that have very clear fascist past and being part of fascist uh, groups or having even direct responsibility for policies implemented during the Bulgarian alliance with the Third Reich. And okay, so maybe speak a little bit about that, because I think many of our viewers, majority of whom come from Canada, United States, Australia, and other English-speaking countries on the other side of the Atlantic, they might not be exactly aware of how things unfolded historically in Bulgaria prior to the Second World War, and many of them probably could be confused about that, because the narrative in the West is that Bulgaria and other countries of the former Eastern Bloc, they've actually re-established democracy after 1989, and the question here is, when did they have that democracy to, to be re-established? fact of the matter is that many countries, like, I don't know, Latvia or Lithuania, before the Second World War were straight up Nazi protectorates. I wouldn't say the same about Bulgaria, although we were in alliance, quite close alliance, with the Third Reich. Speak a little bit about that so that people know what kind of period of history and what kind of heroes, what kind of politicians, what kind of activists, if you like, are, are being put on the pedestal today. Mm -hmm. Okay, first of all, let me just make clear that I'm not a historian, but I have looked at historical narratives like historiography as what I would say part of ideological production. In other words, I'm not one who would say that writing history is an objective endeavor. In other words, it's always through certain frame. And this is what interests me, what kind of framework is being established now after 1989, and it's of course a long process, vis-a-vis -vis the type of interpretation of history that existed prior to that, let's say, during the times of socialist state of Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. And historians that I very much respect have pointed out to the fact that we cannot really speak of any kind of democracy during the interwar period. Let's say that to situate it chronologically from, let's say, World War I until World War II, but especially after 1923 until 1944, Someone like historian Skrbayo, she has been talking about what she calls Cold Civil War in Bulgaria. In other words, this period from 23 to 44 is a very violent period of Bulgarian history where the ruling regimes at that time, monarchies under the monarchy of Boris III, have been engaged in repression of uh, alternative voices, especially on the uh, socialists and communists, right? And a period of repression and murdering of left intellectuals and so on. So poets this, also, like we're talking about yeah, artists. Yes, 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 yeah. poets, uh, journalists and so on. And of course the violence is on both sides, but uh, now the, the framework basically is that this violence was a response to the terrorist tactics of the Communist Party and the left in general. So therefore this should be just, this violence should be justified. So if we have figures like, say, Prime Minister Alexander Tsenkov, who before was clearly situated uh, as a right-wing politician, if not fascist, then pro-fascist kind of dictatorship, 
and he's responsible for the suppression of an uprising that was a response to the, the terrorist forms of his governance after a coup and ousting of a previous left government. Mm -hmm. And so on now this figure, Alexander Tsenkov, is represented as some kind of statesman who some, somehow preserved the order of the same. Later on, Tsenkov, after he is not a prime minister anymore, establishes a clearly pro-Nazi form of organiza political organization and later on escapes to Argentina. So like very much following what we know of the Nazis and fascists that escaped to Latin America. The same thing with, happens with Tsenkov. In, in other words, this is just an example of a figure like Tsenkov as a prime minister who has become rehabilitated. Of course, this is happening also by publishing memoirs of Alexander Tsenkov. So it's a form of a production of the re-establishment of older narratives of people who have had links to, if not being in power, like the case of Tsenkov who was in power, others who have been being staunch supporters of uh, fascist um, uh, Nazi and Nazi like there were also people who were openly adoring Adolf Hitler and stuff like that yeah and and are they also being somehow do they also resurface now as some kind of positive or potentially positive people who have who are part of the Bulgarian history so on the one hand you have figures like Tsenkov who is established as a statement and rehabilitated who is a historical figure on the other hand you actually have certain members of fascist or organizations whom, whose members, for example, have been in positions of power in the monarchist regime, but others who have been convicted by, by the People's Court, which is the tribunal after World War, that were part of our commitment to the alliance, to, you know, to sue the perpetrators of the crimes during Bulgaria's alliance with the Third Reich. Then you have people who were members of these fascist groups who survived but, and then were re-established and uh, now have this heroic aura. And one case is Ilya Minev, who was persecuted by the Communist Party and who had been in jail for about 20 years on and off since 1944. Just to make sure that, that we're on the same page here, like he was not convicted by the People's Tribunal that was established after the Second World War, right? He was afterwards chased by the new authorities yes. and on and off he had been to prison mm -hmm. like for 20 years, right? Yeah, I don't okay. think that... For what? For, let just be straight for up. For fascist, about it. basically for his participation in a fascist organization, the Bulgarian Legionnaires Union. They had the swastika as their symbol. They had General Lukov, who was a leader of these legionnaires, in 1943 was assassinated by the Communist Party because he was kind of blackmailer of the Bulgarian king, the ambassador of Nazi Germany at that time was using. General Lukov was willing to send Bulgarian troops to fight to the Eastern Front with the Russians, to fight with the Soviet Union. For the viewers, I want to just mention that uh, Bulgaria was an uh, ally of the Third Reich, but at least King Boris III managed to prevent sending, prevent sending yeah. Bulgarian troops, right? To go back to the legionaries, this leader of the legionaries, this General Lukov, he was willing to do that. And there were, according to the, I think the justification for his assassination by members of the Communist Party was of the communist resistance, like Yankee fascist mm -hmm. movement was because he was the bigger evil. Boris was perceived as an... Yeah, that's actually pretty interesting. Evil. Probably we could talk about that for another half yeah. an hour or even more, but the, the Boris III, the king of Bulgaria in the 30s, he was uh, he was not really eager. He had to become an ally of the Third Reich because he was obviously blackmailed that if it, if it doesn't happen, all kinds of things could happen to him, to the Bulgarian currency, to Bulgarian also economy, to the extent that it even existed as an actual economy. But let's say yeah, there was very little industrial base of that economy and it was all owned by Germany based by German companies mm -hmm. and part of the agriculture was also owned by the German companies so things were complicated for him he was not eager really to put Bulgaria into the arms of the Third Reich but that was the situation yet there were some people within his environment we've had in the past people that were openly advocating for Bulgaria becoming a like Lithuania, a straight up Nazi protectorate, mm -hmm. and to send Bulgarian troops to the Eastern Front. Despite the fact, by the way, which is also interesting, maybe you want to talk about it a little later, but in, the, in one of the documents, or maybe in the memoirs, you will know better probably than me, Boris III was trying to warn some German officials that they should not be sending Bulgarians to the Eastern Front because they are actually going to immediately defect to the Russian side, together with, I think, orchestra or something like that. A anyway, what I'm trying to say here is that this uh, this guy, uh, a straight-up Nazi, right? He just wanted Bulgaria to become like the Third Reich, to organize the society the same way, to organize this violent counter-revolution, driving down living standards, low-wage police state. And Anti-Semitic. Uh, Anti-Semitic, of course, yes. which is very antypical for, for Bulgaria, by the way, mm -hmm. because anti-Semitism has never had a root in the Bulgarian culture. It's not like in Poland, where 
anti-Semitism has always been a problem. I'm, I'm saying that because Chris Wolkoff is a very symbolic figure. Shortly after 1989, after the changes, the restoration of capitalism began, the, the crazy right-wingers, the most violent wing of them, they started organizing so-called marches in the name of General Wolkoff and Sofia. And I think they continue to do that. And they get the Nazis from everywhere. They come together in Sofia and they organize torch marches and all kinds of very aesthetically and politically disturbing things. And it's still there. And they have been now giving their support for Azov Battalion and so on, so there are definitely links uh, between these groups uh, in, in Eastern Europe. Yeah, okay, but speak a little bit more about Christo Luka. It's difficult probably to make a kind of direct historical revisionism of this particular person and their role, because today on the streets of Sofia every year, you know, you get those marches of people who are, you cannot confuse them with anyone else. You can see the bald heads, yes. the, the fashionable for their political current clothing, all kinds of violent slogans and stuff like that. So you cannot confuse them with anyone else. That's not a group of pet lovers or something. You can see that they are uh, Nazis, neo-Nazis, however you want to refer to them, and uh, that they are people who adore a, not the Third Reich. So it's there, and how, within our conditions, within our context here in Bulgaria, how do you rehabilitate such a person? How do you do that? I think, as in the case of lesser figures like this guy Ilya Mine, for example, mm -hmm. who now has the aura of the Bulgarian Mandela because he establishes a human rights committee after 1989, after being in prisons for so long. And like in the case of another one of these members of the legionnaire, Janko Markov, who was given medal for bravery into it. It goes through the prism, uh, this is what I'm arguing, is that it goes to the prism of anti-communism. Okay. That's why it's very important to think of anti-communism as a mechanism of power, mm -hmm. not only as an ideological production, but as a mechanism of power. And I trace this mechanism of power back to US geopolitical interests. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important to think about that in that way. I don't think this is now only a speculation on my part because I have not researched this, but I don't think it's a coincidence that actually during the first big pro-American government of Ivan Kostov, which is also the shock therapy government, in 1997. Established after the color revolution here. Yeah. Yes. I don't think it's a coincidence that you have the re-established legionnaires who continue with their ideology but now under a different name. Now they call themselves uh, Bulgarian Democratic Forum. Mm -hmm. They become part of this anti-communist uh, coalition which is led by Ivan Kostov and they have 11 representatives in parliament and two very key ministers. The Minister of Finance and the Minister of Justice. So what is happening under these two ministers? On the one hand, under the Minister of Finance, we have the signing of the IMF, the currency board. I just explain for the viewers, the currency board means that Bulgaria hardly has any kind of its own monetary policy. Like the Bulgarian almost. currency is just linked to the euro to the extent that like whatever happens with the euro and it's regulated by the European Central Bank, we have to mimic it or replicate it basically. Yes, mimic it. yes. this is basically the essence of uh, financial neoliberal reform. So you have uh, Moravera, who is this finance minister, whose father was a legionnaire and he considers himself a legionnaire. Then you have Kildosi Simeon, the Minister of Justice, and what happens during that time? You have the Constitutional Court actually invalidating the People's Court. It declares the People's Court constitutionally illegal. Yeah, we're talking about this People's Tribunal that was established after the yes. Second World War, which is why... Which is part of yeah. this agreement with agreement the Allies. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe, maybe it's a very... Maybe, uh, sorry for interrupting you, but I just want to make sure that our viewers understand, because they're not familiar with Bulgarian history. I think it's important to also stress on the fact that this was an agreement with the Allied forces during the Second World War, that in Bulgaria we're going to have that tribunal, we're going to take people to that court, and we're going to eventually execute many of them, just because they were Nazis and fascists, and they were facilitating this crazy nonsense that cost so many uh, lives of so many people. So this is this was not like a communist invention to organize massive repression of democracy-loving people and so on and so forth, which is the narrative that you can hear in Poland and well, the narrative starts to occur right after 1947 with Truman's doctrine, with the rise of the Cold War, and so on. So this is nothing new. But the, what is interesting here is that this new this anti-communism in Bulgaria after 1989 is very much related to what historian Enzo, Enzo Traverso calls the second wave of revisionism, which is European revisionism, which is bringing back the totalitarian narrative. Especially the Zizinski was very vocal in this kind of formation of the totalitarian narrative. So you have it on the left and on the right in the United States in relation to the uh, earlier stages of the Cold War. But in the 60s and 70s, you have American revisionism, 
She was with Patrick, for example, is a historian in the school of revisionism, who claimed that we cannot really use this totalitarian narrative. We have to be more nuanced about what is happening in the socialist states because they had a chance to actually go to the Soviet Union, to be introduced to the archives and so on. And then in the late 80s, during Reagan administration, you have in Europe, you have this emergence of this second wave of revisionism, which is bringing back the totalitarian narrative. So just completely different from the revision of the first revisionism in the United mm -hmm. States. And it's associated especially with the work of Ernst Note and Francois Fourier. In the case of Note, he actually claims that Nazism is a reaction to Bolshevism, and in other words, it's like a... Legitimate. It's absolutely legitimate, legitimate. because the bad Bolsheviks have taken over Russia. Yes, yes. Like something like that, yes. And Fourier, who discredits the French Revolution, and basically his thesis is every kind of revolution would lead to totalitarianism. Mm -hmm. right. And in some way, these historians are very similar to the notion of new liberal intellectuals like Hayek, von Mises, who actually claim that the regulated welfare state they inevitably lead to totalitarianism. Wherefore, they, they, they equate communism or, or Stalin's regime with fascism. Brzezinski, as a matter of fact, he has been on the stage for quite some time. The, this kind of seminal book, Totalitarianism and Dictatorship, which he wrote with Coulter, with another score, which I can't remember, I'm political scientist, I can't remember his name now, but anyway, it's very old. It's, I think, late 50s or early 60s or something like that. And then we know that Brzezinski's role in kind of the form of this Russophile anti communist school of thought in Poland, for example. Mm -hmm. and you Canadian, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. So I think it has to do with the fact that, for the most part, both on the liberal side and conservative side, you have immense production and reproduction of anti communist uh, narratives that form into this official discourse of the kind of the interpretation of history nowadays. And you say it's a system of control, it's not just a doctrine. Oh, I, I, yes, because it has uh, specific political consequences, right? When you have this understanding of your everyday life in the neoliberal capitalism as some kind of unfulfilled, you have this anger. And where do you search for some kind of a role model in this fascist figure? Why? Because in Bulgarian textbooks now, uh, and I have done the research, it's never mentioned the form of the state in this interwar period, in the period of World War II. And the anti-fascist struggle is presented as communist terrorists against the state without any context. So it is very uh, confusing for a student, for a teenager, or for even younger than that, to understand these processes. So when you have this disparaging and basically mm -hmm. of the anti-fascist struggle, when you have even on a level of the European Union, this what Traverse also calls equal violence thesis, which comes from the work of people like Fourier, for example, that both fascism and anti-fascism are equally violent, which is absurd, basically, what this, this narrative claims is, yes, uh, the Nazis perpetrated horrible crimes, but also the anti-fascists perpetrated horrible crimes. So that's kind of symmetrism. Yeah, that yeah. To, yeah. And this is a process of the kind of recreation of new collective memory, right? Okay, but let's let's speak a little bit about those guys who were put on the pedestal right after 1989. Those guys that survived this horrible terror of 50 years and stuff. So they, they survived the, the Socialist Republic, the People's Republic. It had fallen in 1989. And then, then what happened to them? There is a process of commemoration. There were insistences of including this Ilya Minev in Bulgarian textbooks as an example of resistance and as a human rights activist and so on. So, and he has two monuments, one in, in Sofia and one in his village. Definitely there is a process of reinventing him as this kind of figure of importance that is a human rights activist and someone who stood up to the communist regime and so on. Ilya Minev tried to get into the political process, but maybe because of the fact that there was this, let's say, distrust among the intellectuals who were dis the dissident intellectuals at that time, who were very much on the left. They were critics of the type of uh, socialism that existed at the time, but they weren't really apologists of, of capitalism, especially in the beginning. Later on, it's another story. But this is why Ilya Minev could not be accepted as part of these dissident intellectuals and get into the political process. Because I think these kind of figures were kept aside, especially during the time when Zhelev, Zhelev Zhelev, who was the first president and also the leader of the new... The first president after 1989, president yes, of Bulgaria. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and the leader of the new formed the Union of Democratic Forces, which is the contrary to the Bulgarian Socialist Party and, and the party supported by the United States and the West. 
even he maybe also his society was immune to these fascist figures but also he had he was aware of the fact that there are these fascist elements that are that are becoming part of the Union of Democratic Forces in his biography he writes about that but then later on when even Jerev was attacked by his own party and especially when Kostov comes into power you have this process where these figures become more and more ingrained into the Union of the Democratic uh, Forces and Minev is not alive anymore but the mythology starts this figure of human rights and the, the narrative starts to emerge like memoirs written about him and so on and so, nowhere does it say that he was repressed for his fascist task he <laughs> Had, he was an editor of a newspaper after 1989, I forgot the name of the newspaper, where he writes that Hitler was a great leader, that the Holocaust didn't exist, that the Americans put yeah. gas chambers in after they arrived at the labor camps. He writes that after he 1989 that as an editor in his own yes, paper. Yes, in his own paper, yes. He writes that, this could be fact-checked. Also in his paper there are anti-Semitic views. In 2000, he is he is a deputy in parliament under the this big coalition led by the Union of Democratic Forces, which is then renamed. So just to just explain, Union of Democratic Forces was the kind of coalition that took power in 1992, if I remember, 1991 in Bulgaria. 1991, the first attempt for shock therapy, a horrible consequence. As a result of their policies of shock therapy, they did not get into power in the next six years. Yeah. It We can call them... them they needed a colored revolution. We can call them radical that. extremists, and uh, new liberal extremists, basically, yeah. because this was the the third attempt for shock, shock therapy after Poland and Poland is the first one maybe the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia mm -hmm. I'm not sure Hungary maybe Hungary Hungary, mm -hmm. Hungary yes Poland and Hungary and then the third Hungary was even worse than Poland they privatized everything <laughs> yeah and it had to get to this point of where the socialists were completely discredited I call it, I mean, I dare call it colored revolution, what happened in 1996, yes. 1997. This was organized by the Americans, with the support of the Russians, by the way. So they would have not gotten back in power had it not been for that colored revolution, in my opinion. And things would have unfolded maybe a little differently. I, I don't want to speculate right now about that. What is important here is those people with views as you just described, especially the CBM Aminev, right? He establishes a paper in this democratic new reality establishes a paper where he writes things which are absolutely hair-raising nonsense. Yes. And he is a hero today. Uh, and, so, and, and also Markov who said in parliament in 2000 that the, uh, the Jewish people were an enemy people at that time. Yeah. And so... At that time, that is the, the time of the Second World War. Yes, and he compared the deportation of the yeah. Jewish people in the occupied territories in Macedonia and, Tra and Tragia as he compared it to the deportation of Japanese after Pearl Harbor. Right. So in other words, he justified the, the Holocaust in Parliament. Right. And so this is, so also, this is an absurd figure, this guy. He's obviously he a, a ludicrous figure. <laughs> who was given a medal. By the Bulgarian state, current Bulgarian by state, the state democratic By Bulgarian. the defense minister of the Bulgarian state, by, by the former defense minister right. of the Bulgarian state. But, but what is important here, and this is the point I'd like you to elaborate on a little bit for the end of our program, is those people crazy on their face you can see that by what they say in the parliament or outside parliament in their papers in other papers wh whatever they do they always leave a smelly trace of neo-nazism fascism hitler rehabilitation that kind of matters right they do that and what is interesting about it is that they get all the support from the democratic forces, the liberal NGOs, pro-American organizations, embassies of Western countries. They are supported by those who claim are against repression and against dictatorship, right? Let's go back several decades, because I don't think it's strange, mm -hmm. and talk about what happened after World War II, what was the United States uh, policy vis-a-vis -vis Nazis, and fascist after World War II. I don't know if the viewers know about Operation Paperclip, but this is basically an operation where the United States government, in the name of fighting communism, recruits thousands of Nazis and various fascists from Europe into the United States that then start that then are employed in the CIA, in NATO, in NASA, in all of these structures. And some of them are sent back, like for example, the monster of Buchenwald responsible for the murder of three million Soviet prisoners and he becomes, I think, he becomes the chief of intelligence of the German state, of the federal German public, yes. So it's not so unusual and that's why I think we should trace it to America's 
geopolitical, geostrategic interests in the region. Because if these people are laughable, Gianco Marco, for example, who, who is really, this is our kind of contribution to the rehabilitation of fascists who are still living, who are still among the living, right? But I would say that if not intentionally, it is the responsibility of such intellectuals, like liberal intellectuals and conservative intellectuals and people who, because of their anti-communist, their fanatic anti-communist one-sided representation of history, have led to this rehabilitation process. Mm -hmm. Because parallel to this, you also have now very much officially established narrative that there was no fascism in Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. That because the government itself was not necessarily fascist in the sense that there was no Führer, therefore there was no fascism. If That's we, only symbolism somehow. If we think of fascism as a historical process, yes, maybe there was no fascism, but if we think of fascism as a mechanism of, of, of power, like using fascism as a mechanism of power, like in the case of the monarchist regime, okay, there is no fascism, but there are fascist figures inside government. You have the Minister of Justice, who comes from a fascist organization. You have Alexander Berev, who is he's responsible for the formation of anti-Semitic war and coming laws modeled under the third right like commissar of the jewish question or something like that and he is sent to study the, the law of the third right so in order to uh, synchronize it with the bulgarian to make an anti-semitic law so how is this not fascist policy how is this not how is the existence of such laws as the people's uh, protection of the nation law or something like that that's the translation which is clearly anti-semitic and also anti-communist law because the, the other enemy that is identified there is the communists and this is how actually how we come to the question that actually the first anti-communists the first staunch anti-communists were of course the fascists were of course Mussolini and Hitler right what I mean is like that the biggest enemy of Nazism and fascism is of course is, is communism sure. historically right? but then this is how we have this weird sort of alliance between fascism and anti-communist liberalism especially figures like this historian Ernst Note and also our president Zelev who basically say fascism is the lesser of two evils because it preserves private property. This is the exact same claim that one makes. And this is the philosophical it's fundament of it. It's, it's better, or it's it's not maybe not better, but it's not as bad because it at least preserved private property. Right? So and this is the philosophical reference that they make. Not because it was better for the people, not because it, it lifted masses of people out of poverty or anything like that on the country, it actually <laughs> drove them into poverty. But no, because it was private property, you know. Okay. We'll have to conclude this discussion before today. I think it's a fascinating topic and I'm really grateful for people like you who research that and who help us discover the true face of these narratives that we keep hearing and, and who also help us make sense of why is suddenly the European Union in bed with a country like Ukraine, where obviously the organization of society uh, there and the organization of politics and the quality, the political quality of the, their internal political process is a very disturbing uh, phenomenon when you yes. come to analyze it, right? pro-fascist kind of uh, apologists, some of them biologically linked with fascist figures and also these new forms of fascist, neo-Nazi kind of hooligans and so on and liberals for whom anti-communism is the biggest evil of all precisely because of communism their the uh, communism because of their belief in free private market, property, free market, <laughs> private property <laughs> and so on and what I want to mention that is very parallel to how things started to happen in Ukraine is this kind of interesting green light that municipal government in Sofia gives to these hooligans with their like Nazi sympathies and uses them in attacking people who are gathered to preserve the anti-fascist memory because now uh, the one of the main attempts to erase the memory, collective memory of anti-fascism is this declaration to remove the monument of the Soviet army Sophia. in Sofia. Yeah. And hooligans are being used, and it's, and it's known that they're being used by certain figures in a local government in Sofia to be used as these aggressive attackers of people protecting the monument. And if you don't see how this plays out in the case of these football hooligans, in Ukraine turned into this Azov battalion and so on. And I yeah, yeah, I, I think that's very important because Azov started precisely as a, an organization of radical hools from Makov, if I remember correctly. Yeah. yeah, so in the case of Ukraine, you have like a small amount 
of Western uh, Ukrainian Russophobic ideology, ultranationalism, which had to go through the heroization of Nazi collaborators like Bandera and Shukhevich and so on, and their the building of monuments and so on, and spreading out this ideology to the whole of Ukraine, which of course would lead to the civil war that yeah. happened, because 7 million Ukrainians fought on the side of the Red Army against Nazism, against Hitler, against the, these atrocities that these about 200,000 other Ukrainians in the Western part committed again, again. This is a very similar process. Ken. Thank you. Thank you, Bajin, for this discussion today. It was fascinating to hear all those insights and your analysis, and we're looking forward to publishing your article. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs>